Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Nehemiah, and while you're finding that, uh, I will just say that, uh, yeah, it was a, just a long day for Mrs. Wagon Schutz and having some difficulty with her, her legs when she's uh, on them a, a long time at uh, one time, and so she was trying to get ready to come tonight, and, and uh, I ran out of time waiting for her, so I said, well, I'm going to go solo tonight, so... I flew, uh, I flew over here by myself with one wing and uh, it took a while going in loops like that, you know, because I have a broken shoulder. So at any rate, uh, I made it here and just in time, the pastor and, uh, and Brother Graham were standing at the back door doing paper, rock, scissors uh, to see who was going to preach. Well, okay, it wasn't quite that bad. Uh, but at any rate, we're glad to be here. Thank you so much for accommodating us. We've had... Uh, just a couple of things happened just recently with uh, my shoulder being uh, damaged, and I had surgery two weeks ago on that. And then uh, with my wife just having a couple of things going on, we just didn't think we could do the stairs for the prophet's chamber here. You've been very kind to provide the uh, hotel with a wonderful thing called an elevator. Amen. Amen. It just takes you up, and then it takes you down, and it's great. And uh, so it's been, it's been a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Beds have been super comfortable. And, uh, and so just thank you so much for taking care of us. And food's been great. Fellowship has been better. And we've enjoyed every minute of it. Take your Bibles there in the, in the book of Nehemiah then. And look, uh, beginning in chapter 13, chapter 13. Tomorrow night is the scheduled end of, of this uh, Bible conference, and that's always a difficult time for me uh, preaching at a conference or a meeting like this, because I know I have uh, this message and one more, and when it gets down to that tight, I usually got about five or six I want to preach, and it's just like trying to make sure I, I get what God wants in for this meeting, and... and um, I just, uh, I always feel inadequate. I always feel, and I know that uh, the, the Bible is just, it's Jesus Christ from one cover to the other. And wherever you scratch the Bible, it, it bleeds his precious blood. I understand that. But I also believe that God has messages that he wants delivered at a certain time to a certain people in a certain place. And I want to try to have the mind of God. And so, I'm going to uh, kind of tap into or uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of an off-ramp of uh, what uh, Brother Bockhaus pre was preaching this morning and um, about, uh, he was talking about going through with the, the tabernacle and then the permanent place of the house of God, uh, the temple that was made and how David did, he did, he prepared for those, uh, for the uh, building of that, and, uh, but yet God did not let him build it. And so he, that was left to his son, Solomon, uh, to build a place for God. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter who it is in the Bible. You know, one, one of the wonderful things about the Bible is it doesn't just uh, whitewash the heroes of the faith Amen. and just kind of tell you just the good things you, that uh, they want you to hear. It tells you the good and the bad. And boy, David, you know, he was a man of war. And uh, he, he had, uh, b you know, b described as having bloody hands. And so God uh, did not allow him to build that temple. But, but yet it's built by Solomon. And, you know, Solomon had his issues with the plurality of, of wives and, and how all of that affected him, uh, drawing his heart away from the things of God. And, uh, and of course, we know how that goes, it goes, you know, uh, just a, a few generations down and, and you have the divided kingdom and tribes to the north and tribes to the south and they are at odds with each other and at times both at odds with God 
from the tribes to the north going very quickly into idolatry and very soon being allowed, God allowed uh, the nation, the uh, the the uh, Assyrians to come in there and conquer them and and carry them away into captivity. And you see a lot of. By the, by the way, it's it's been interesting to me in the thirty three almost years that we've been here. Uh, when we started taking missions trips with our young people uh, many years ago to go to some of the uh, former Soviet countries. I, I think the Lord has allowed me I, to preach in around 15 foreign countries. I, I, it, may be, it may be a little bit more. I, I just I have to stop and really think about it. And it's not that, boy, when somebody, you know, if I, if I wanted to put that on a, you know, a resume, boy, I preached in 15 foreign countries, that might sound impressive. Nobody ever asked me to come. I just kind of went along with our young people and they said, oh, well, the pastor's here, we'll let, <laughs> we'll let him preach. And so, so I pull out, uh, you know, try, try to find an easily uh, translatable uh, sermon that I could preach. And, but, but it has been a blessing to be able to preach in, uh, in that way. But one of the interesting things I found is such a parallel to the way that uh, these nations in the, in the Bible, how they displaced the nation of Israel. They carried them away captive, and then they brought, uh, they brought Assyrians in, and they gave them their land. And the idea was to intermingle the people to where they would not uh, uh, regather and re, uh, try to re-strengthen themselves. And then the same thing happened at a later date. The tri- tribes to the south uh, uh, hold, held on a little bit longer, trying to in, in and out of being faithful to God, good kings and bad kings. But they were a little more good than bad for a while until, until the measure of God's wrath was full and he allowed the Babylonians to come in and capture them and carry them away captive. And they brought in uh, people from that region. And, gave, and, and what I found is that when you go, like uh, right, uh, right now, if you, well, I don't know about right now, but before the war broke out, I, I've been to Ukraine, had the chance to be in the Ukraine maybe six, seven, eight times. I'm not even sure how many times. First time was probably around 27 years ago. And so 27 years ago gets you back to not not long after they had their independence. Because all of these nations, you know, you read about the fall of the Soviet Union and, and all you young people, you hear about that, and it sounds like, oh man, that was that must have been like in our great grandfather's time and all that. And it's just not that long ago. I became the pastor of Twin Ports Baptist Church in 1991, and that is give or take a year. Where most of these na- when most of these nations actually got their independence from the Soviet Union, and I've been uh, had the privilege of being in many of the places where where uh, their independence was declared, uh, independence uh, um, uh, the the area in uh, in uh, Czechos- uh, excuse me in the Czech Republic. Uh, Independence uh, uh, Hall, they called it. It's a, it's a it's a big open area where where they described people that were there uh, s- described that thousands and thousands of people packed into that square, Independence Square, and uh, and with their uh, their car keys, you know, there was uh, tens of thousands of people. It's a huge area, jangling their keys and with lighters had uh, had lights and declaring their independence again. They had not been allowed to speak the Czech language for many years. Many of the words had almost become obsolete to where many people, the younger people, think about this, that, uh, everyone under the age of oh, oh, uh, 20 or so, I mean, they, they, they'd never spoken the Czech language, never heard it. And they found old, old printing, they, they, there was the, they, were, they were not allowed to print books in the Czech language, but they had these hidden away uh, areas where they had the old printing presses. We got to in a village. We got to go down into a basement area. It was it was hidden from view, and there were old printing presses down there where they had uh, kept printing some of the some books in the Czech language. And they had they had found a copy of an old Czech Bible, and that old Czech Bible they used as a foundation for rebuild, helping to rebuild the Czech language. And what a blessing that was. 
And then uh, in many times in the, in the country of Ukraine. But what I found is when you go to the large cities in Ukraine, we were uh, most of the time in the city of Odessa, a couple of million people. And when you talk to the Ukrainians there, they'd say, oh, we love everybody. We love Americans. We love everybody. And uh, when you go out to the villages, the more remote you got, they'd say, oh, we, we hate Americans. We don't love anybody. We don't like anybody. They were much more nationalistic. Well, the reason for that is when the Soviet Union, when uh, Russia, you know, took over all those uh, those lands and in the in the past and became the Soviet Union, what they did was they went into those regions and displaced many of those people, and brought Russians in and gave them their land. And so, what you have in these large populated cities is these people are a mixture of Ukrainian and Russian. And so they're just like, oh, we just love everybody kind of a thing. And, uh, and by the way, that's the same exact basis that Russia is arguing that we're, we're just going in there, we're just trying to salvage our people from, from this evil regime because these people are really Russians. Well, many of them do have Russian blood in them. But boy, you get outside those, uh, those big cities and those people, they're like, I was out in a little village one time. And uh, and I had a I had a uh, my own interpreter. We would have been out knocking doors for a few days, and and uh, my interpreter was Sergey. And uh, and the thing was, the, the American pastors and stuff they'd talk amongst themselves, and everything looked run down and and uh, and chaotic. And and so the Americans would talk about uh, amongst themselves about how you know everything looked terrible. And back then, I mean, still driving these little Lada cars. I mean, and I don't mean a lot of them. I mean, it was called a lot of L-A-D-A. And uh, it's just a little, uh, like an old uh, square Fiat. I mean, that's a, just this little, you know, it's a box with a rubber band in it and, uh, and just wind it up and you could go a little bit and that's about what they were. And I was, we were sitting visiting one time just uh, taking a little bit of, br- of a break in the middle of the day. And I recognized that, okay, you know, the interpreters can understand what the Americans are saying to each other. And the Americans just, they didn't think about it because they can't understand us, we can't understand them. They just, and they just weren't very careful about what they said. You know, we're there to try to reach people for Christ. We're not there to, we're not there to try to, you know, talk about, oh, how much better is America than this? And, and so I, I talked to my interpreter and I said, Sergey, I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, what what is it? I, I said, you know, you hear you hear the Americans talking, and uh, you know, it's negative about your country. And I said, I, 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 does that bother you? And he said, well, it used to, but he said, I finally, just decided if it's true, it's true. And so I'm just trying to, you know. I don't want him to feel uneasy, and so to kind of balance thing out, things out, I said, well, Sergei, I said, well, let me ask you this, what, what, do, what do Ukrainians think about Americans? And just then, we were in, a, we were in a, an apartment building, high-rise kind of an apartment building, and it was all military housing. We weren't supposed to be there. We were just, we could have thrown stones and hit the Moldovan border and foreigners weren't supposed to be within 25 or 30 miles of the border because they think you're just there to stir up trouble. I was staying in the, I was in the apartment of a man that was in the Ukrainian military and he had his, part of his job was uh, to keep track of and and, uh, manipulate all the mass for all of their weapons and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that uh, it's been on the news recently to be remind us that it wasn't that long ago that Ukraine had the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world next to the United States. And they gave them up when the U.S. said, listen, if you give them up, then we'll protect you if Russia ever invades you. Which promise we haven't kept very well, by the way. And whatever you think about whether we should or not, I'd I'd say we ought to keep our promise because the only reason that they're invaded is because they gave up those nuclear weapons. And so uh, I said, what what do you, what do Ukrainians think about Americans? Just then the door burst open and a little boy from across the hall came in chasing his dog and he's chasing his dog, calling his dog, Dick, come Dick, Dick. 
And the interpreter kind of looked at me kind of sheepishly and he said, well, now you know, we name our dogs American names. <laughs> and that's what they thought of us. You know, they think Americans are just dogs. But that's a lot of what was going on in, in, the, in the land uh, uh, that God had promised the nation of Israel. And so God allowed them to be carried away captive, but he's not done. He's not done. You, uh, you've seen how he's regathered them. This is only, by the way, this is the, the, the way that they have survived recently is, is just a microcosm of the things that God has done to preserve the nation of Israel. Some years ago I ran across a, a series of documentaries that, were, uh, that had to do with air combat. And the, the series of those that I particularly enjoyed, they had a, a section of that, a, a, I don't know, five or six part series. And it was talking about the, uh, the Israeli, it was showing uh, Israeli Air Force, how, how God had, and it wasn't, this wasn't a religious thing. They weren't talking about God, but they were talking about the, the, the way that even though they were not the, air, the superior air force in the region, how that uh, through a preemptive strike, how they were able to destroy much of Egypt's air force while it was still on the ground. They didn't get them, they didn't even get them launched. And, uh, and God has just over and over again preserved uh, that, uh, that place and that people. He's not done yet. He's not done yet. But that brings us to this part of Nehemiah that, that in, that's entwined with what uh, your pastor was talking about this morning with the uh, the temple, and let's just pick it up and and uh, you probably are familiar with uh, all the stuff that's going surrounding this. But in Nehemiah thirteen and verse number one, the Bible says, "On that day, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite." the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing y'all remember how the God uh, how about how they tried to get Balaam to curse the nation of Israel and he could not remember that and so God just, he threw Balaam, through Balaam, uh, Satan said, hey, I can't curse them for you, but if you get them to, to fall into idolatry and stuff, their God will take care of them. And so you're familiar with that. Let's move on. Verse 3, now it came to pass when they heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib the priest having the oversight of the chamber of the house of, of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the corn, the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. We're familiar with the story how that he goes to the king and he grant, he's granted permission to go back and, uh, and see the how what's happened to the devastation of his people and the land and the city and the temple, right? And then it says, let's just keep going then. In verse 7, and I came to Jerusalem and understood all the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Let's stop there and let's have a word of prayer. Father, we've read your word. Now therefore bless the reading of it. God, I pray that you'll help me tonight. I, I do not feel very settled in my heart and in my mind. 
I pray that you will direct my thoughts to say only what you want said, what will be helpful. Lord, I pray that as I sound a warning, God, it will be uh, taken to heart in our, in our hearts that, that we want to make sure that your house stays what it ought to be. God, in all these things, we give Christ, our Savior, the preeminence. In his precious name we pray, amen. If you're not familiar with the name Tobiah, let's just go back in Nehemiah a little bit, back to chapter 2, and remind ourselves who Tobiah is. In chapter 2 and verse number 10 of the same book, we're just doing some background and history here. takes a little bit to get up to speed on this if you have not read it recently or thought about it recently. And in chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, When Samballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant of the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of of the children of Israel. Tobiah is one of the men that when, uh, when these men, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Zerubbabel, when these men started returning and seeking the welfare of Jerusalem, seeking the welfare, uh, uh, the rebuilding of the temple, it grieved the, these men like Tobiah. Tobiah heard it. He was exceedingly upset that someone came to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Jump down to verse number 19. But when Samballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, uh, and Geshem uh, the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? This is, of course, when they began to rebuild the walls. Amen? If you say amen, I think you know what I'm talking about, and I go faster. <laughs> if you start looking like you know, you're not 100% sure, we've got to back up and we've got to start reading the entire thing. So, amen? amen? All right. I knew I'd get you on my side. Chapter 4. Flip the page to chapter 4, verse number 3. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. You remembered probably those that were taunting the people of God as they began to rebuild the wall. You probably remember the story that someone said, well, even if a fox runs on that, that wall will crumble. It won't stand. You just might not have remembered his name was Tobiah. And the Bible says, go to chapter number 6 with me. We're just getting a quick update on the man Tobiah. Chapter 6 and verse 10, Afterward I came to the house of, of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of uh, Mehetabiel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee, yea, yea in the night, Will they come to slay thee? And I said, should a man such as I flee? And who is there that, being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Sanballat and Tobiah hired this guy to try to get Nehemiah going to the temple so he could kill him. Verse 17, chapter 6, verse 17. Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. This is starting to get very Interesting. The intrigue is starting to build. Because now the enemy of the people of God is now BFFs with some of the leaders of the nation of Israel. If it were today, 
you'd say, oh, they follow each other on social media. They're texting back and forth. Can you imagine? Tobiah, he's texting. Tobiah, it's not verse, this verse is not in here, but Tobiah, as he came to Jerusalem, heard a sound, opened up his pocket, and said, it said, you've got mail. Just kidding. So many of the nobles of Judah are writing letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah is writing letters to them. Verse 18, there, for there were many in Judah sworn unto him. Because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Erah, and his son, Johanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Now, when you start chasing down names in the Old Testament, there is really no end to it. But suffice it to say, and I encourage you to look up these names. Just do a quick search on them in any, just in the Bible or in a Bible dictionary, and here's what you'll find. Tobiah and his son have married into noble families in the nation of Israel. They are now linked by marriage into Levitical and priestly lines. These, these, some of these names that you will find that these people were related to, they were in the line of David. They were in, the, they were in a priestly line. And these are the ones that had, had sworn oath to Tobiah. And Tobiah was, they were, they were uh, besties. And they were all chummy, chummy, buddy, buddy. And here comes these men such as Ezra and Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, coming back to seek the welfare of the nation of Israel. And they are upsetting the apple cart. I can just imagine pastor coming into a church and, you know, becoming the pastor of a church only to find out that, boy, there's a lot of things going on in that church. And, and the, what the church looks at him and says, well, you're, you're causing us trouble. You're troubling us. No, no. The sin is troubling you. The sin is troubling you. It, is, it was not long, very shortly after I became the pastor at, uh, in Superior. Matter of fact, <laughs> my, you, know, you know they talk about, uh, Brother Graham, the honeymoon period, you know, when you become the pastor and there's this, there's this period of time where, you know, everybody loves everybody. And then you go, you get past the honeymoon period and it's like, you know, um, the, 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 the fight is on and uh, et cetera. My honeymoon period was less than one day. <laughs> because between the morning and evening service, as I showed up for the evening service, there was a man that uh, said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And I, I was young in the ministry, never pastored a church before. I've been an assistant pastor for a total of eight years, but I never pastored before. And, and so I, I thought, well, okay, you know, this, this shouldn't take long. So we stepped into the office just off of the platform, and, and the first thing he did was he reached over, grabbed my tie, and he says, well, for one thing, around here on Sunday nights, we don't wear ties. He started pulling my tie off. And I stopped him and I said, well, if you didn't notice, there's a new sheriff in town and, you know, was, I plan on wearing a tie. I said, I, I just don't do those little alligators on the little, you know, polo shirts and that, that's just, you know, that's just not me. I said, well, okay. He said, well, I just, I just thought you'd know I want to resign from being a deacon. Number one, I didn't even know who he was. Yeah. It was my first Sunday. I didn't, I, I mean, I met with a pulpit committee. Some of them were deacons, but I didn't know who were deacons and who weren't. I, I hadn't had a chance to find that out. He said, I need to be re I resigned from being a deacon. And I said, well, I haven't even been here long enough to make you mad. What, what could you possibly, what could possibly make you want to resign from being a deacon? He said, well, my wife and I like to go to the bars line dancing. 
And he said, um, I know from something you said when you candidated for the church that you don't want me doing that, being a deacon. I said, well, I'll tell you this, I have no idea what I said, but I'm glad I said it. (laughs) Because you're right. I said, beyond that, God don't want you doing that, being a deacon. But I said, the bigger problem is you seem satisfied in the world. And I said, I, I want to know how it is that a Christian feels so comfortable in the world. Of course, that was the end of the conversation. But that started a long process. The church had never heard of you know, church discipline or dealing with things like that. And so I had to just try to bring them along slow and, uh, and figure it out. We eventually had to just remove them from, from the church. Listen, so this, oh man, you're, you're, you're troubling the church. No, sin was troubling the church. Complacency was troubling the church. I mean, when I'd go to make visits on church members, and when I'd pull up in front of their trailer or the trailer park, and their tr- truck is sitting outside, and on the truck are 25 or 30 beer cans where they were just standing out there drinking beer just before I got there, and they just walked in the house as I pulled up so they didn't have time to get rid of the evidence. And these are church members. These are pastor's kids. With Nehemiah, Ezra, Zerubbabel, and these men came back and they're beginning to seek the welfare of Israel. It's like, oh, oh you, you're, you're troubling us. Well, us upsetting the apple cart, yes. But here's the problem. They had so allowed themselves to get tied in with the world. God said, hey, when you go into the land I give you, you're supposed to completely wipe out or remove all the inhabitants of the land. And they did not do so. They did not do so. I don't know what all of the genetic descendants or, or ancestors of these Palestinians are, but the word Palestine, I think, comes from the word Philistine. And I, I believe that their genetic uh, history is more complicated than that, but, but it does shed light on the issue. And that is that the people that, that they did not get rid of when they got in the land have been a thorn in the flesh for, for their whole existence. You say, what's the problem? James 4, 4 says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So what has happened? What has happened is, and the verses that we read first, uh, 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 then we went back, but when we read in chapter number 13, Now they have gone in, these men have gone in, and they've taken a chamber in the temple, in the house of God, and they've cleaned it out. And what was that chamber used for? It had been a place where they stored the meat offerings, the frankincense, verse number 5 of chapter 13, the vessels, the tithes of corn, the new wine, the oil, that was commanded to give to the Levites, the Levitical tribe. They were the ones that served in the temple. And then, given to the Levites, the singers, the porters, and the offerings of the priests. This chamber used to house what was used to take care of those that were serving in the house of God. Right? In the service of the house of God. They cleaned it out and made an apartment for Tobiah. Simply call the message tonight, Tobiah in the temple. Tobiah in the temple. When when, uh, these men, when Nehemiah comes back 
Uh, he's grieved at what's going on. He sees that all this happened. He was not uh, on site when all this happened. And he came, and the Bible says that, that when he came and he saw what was going on, I like, what, I like his reaction. He says in verse number 8 of chapter 13, It grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Boy, I like him, amen? He is just no nonsense. He didn't call a committee meeting. He didn't ask for a vote. He just recognized something that was wrong. And I can just see, boy, I just like the picture in my mind, amen, of, of him going in there. And here's all Tobias stuff. There's his beanbag chair. There's his, you know, he's got one of those macrame swings probably over there. Because that's just the kind of, that's the kind of people that are Tobias, you know? Uh, they're, just, they're just that sort. And, uh, and Neil, boy, he sees all this stuff, and he just, he, t- he takes a chapter before, he, before Jesus ever comes on the scene, he takes a chapter out of the way Jesus dealt with stuff, right? When Jesus went to the temple, and he started clearing them out, I mean, he went with a whip. I, G, uh, and so, so he just begins grabbing Tobias' stuff, and he's just throwing it out, and just throwing it out. By the way, that's the way we ought to have a heart for the things of God and for the house of God. That we are, by the way, God is a jealous God, and we ought to be jealous of His house for Him and because of Him. And so these nobles of Judah, he's, he's married in to the, to, the, to the priestly line. His son is married in to the priestly line. Uh, they're, all, they're all linked in. And the way this happens, I, w- I want to just talk about some a little bit how this happens. We, what happened is, is they started to intermarry. If we can just kind of use modern, modern uh, uh, illustrations. And so Junior grows up and he goes out in the world and he finds him a woman, right? Let's call him Junior. Let's call him Samson. And let's call her, I don't know, Delilah. Why don't we, uh, you know, let's just think about this. Why don't we just, you know, he goes out in the world and he, and he says, boy, now there's a looker, right? He didn't care. There was nothing spiritual about it. Hey, she looks good. Get her for me. And of course, we know how that turned out. So what happens is, you know, Junior goes out in the world, he find, and he finds a young boy. Boy, she's a good looker. Yeah, but is she saved? Well, I don't know, but she's. Well, I, but I think she's close to being saved. And so they get married, and it's like the the first Thanksgiving comes around, and it's like, hey, we're going to we're going to mom and dad's for Thanksgiving. And she, and, and she says, hey, would it be all right? You know, our families are, you know, we don't live that far apart. Would it be all right if I asked my mom and dad to come over as well and share Thanksgiving? They didn't have Thanksgiving. But anyway, you know, we're being modern about it, right? And so they come, yeah, yeah. And I'll check with my mom and dad. Yeah, have them come. Man, her, your, your wife's, you know, your in-laws, just have them come. And they come over for Thanksgiving. They say, oh, man. We're so glad to come here and be part of your Thanksgiving. And I, boy, every family has its own traditions, don't they? And I see you have traditions, you know. Uh, you, you, uh, you, have, you read the Bible and you're thankful for what God's given you. And you go around the table and everybody says something they're thankful for. And you sing, uh, sing songs, thanking God, etc. Oh, that's wonderful. Everybody has traditions. We have our own little traditions. I wonder if it'd be all right if we just bring along some of our traditions. And, and we just have these little, we just have these little, these little, figurines that we kind of use for our thanksgiving they're just they're just little representations of of gods that that we've grown up with they're kind of our tradition oh well okay let's just let's we'll just let them come on and so and then it one thing leads to another and and god looks down and he sees his people practicing idolatry and that's how it happens. Be- because we are not diligent. 
because we are too accommodating to the world. What did the Bible say? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, there's, a, there's an issue here. This is not my house. This is not your house. This is God's house. Amen. He gets to say what happens in his house. When we come to his house, it's not to eat our own supper. It's to, to have his. So what happens? Uh, the, what's the danger? Tobiah in the temple. Here's the problem. Uh, when we compromise with the world, when we allow uh, uh, Satan to, to creep into the New Testament church, and listen, when people get saved, hey, that's great. But you know, Paul had to write back to the church of Corinth and say, hey, there's some things that you got saved, but there's some things you still have that are not good. He had to deal with the silversmiths. He had to deal with the goddesses of Diana and etc. Why? Because they had all this background and, and they just tried to, you know, the, the idea is to just bring it in with us. Just We just kind of keep these and just add this new thing to it. No, our God is a jealous God. And we need to be jealous for Him. The problem is, they did, number one, they did not recognize the enemy. They did not recognize the enemy. Well, the reason I took the time to read with you all of those verses was to remind you who Tobiah was. He was no friend. He was, he was uh, uh, involved in, in writing letters to try to sabotage this whole, this whole thing. He was, the one, he was one of the ones writing back uh, to those kings saying, hey, these people over here, they're, gonna, they're trying to rise up against you and overthrow you, and, uh, and you need to send some soldiers over here and take care of them. He was involved in that. He was trying to undermine their work. He's working behind the scenes because he's, he's got relation. His father-in-law, he's married into the priestly line. Can't you just imagine Tobiah talking to his father-in-law? I just imagine, hey, dad. You know, a lot of people call their father-in-law dad, right? Hey, dad. Boy, I see these guys coming back, and, and, and man, they're sure stirring up things. And his father-in-law's like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's cause, causing quite the stir. Yeah, I just don't, you know, I think it's just better just things stay the way they are. Let's just, let's just kind of just cruise on and, and let's, maybe we can get these guys out of here. You say, how you know that's going? Because they're writing letters to him, he's writing letters to them. They're communicating. Boy, sometimes this goes, sometimes I, I, I look around, it's like, boy, you know, these people talking to those people, these people talking to those people, and neither one talking to me. And I say, hmm. I say to myself, self? I what that's all about. And I just kind of walked back in the middle of that and said, hey, how's things going? Gets real quiet. It's amazing how that works. Sure. What's happening? The devil's sneaking in. Sure. Satan is sowing discord not recognizing the devil. Here, they made a room in the temple for Tobiah, one of their enemies. But now they think he's, they've made him one of their friends. You know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's a deceiver. Well, what would it hurt, preacher? We get one of these new song books that doesn't have the blood in it because, well, seeing about the blood, it's so, it's so Old Testament. Right? I don't know if you've ever had that preach. I've had people say, that's so Old Testament. Sure. Seeing about the blood. Can't we just, we just need to see more modern things. And, uh, and can't, we, can't we just, what, what, why don't we just not use the, the hymn book? Let's just, let's just sing choruses and let's just do some of that. Hey, why don't we do that? Hey, you know what, preacher, what we ought to do is, what we ought to do is, instead of preaching uh, all the time, let's have some, some dramas. Let's just, let's just have some plays and, and let's, have, let's have open mic night. Hey, preacher, had, had years ago, I was having trouble with this one, one fella, and he's just like, 
He said, I, I just, I believe that, I, I just think that we ought not have, you ought not be able to have, uh, to, you call some evangelist or some missionary or whatever, and you have them come through and preach. And I, I just don't think you ought to be able to do that. I just, matter of fact, I don't even think we ought to have a, a head pastor. I think it ought to just be all the men in the church just, just rotate and take turns and not have a pastor. Say, is that a thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, equal elder rule. Just don't have a pastor. We don't want God in charge. We just, we just want to just have everybody get to have a say. Everybody get to give their own opinion. And what you get when you get that, is, listen, I did. Many, many years ago, I was gone. I was on a trip and I talked to my wife. We had, we had only been there a year, year and a half. And uh, talked to my wife, and I said, hey, babe, how'd the service go? She goes, oh, I don't think you're going to like this. And she goes, but I know. She knew enough about me that if she didn't tell me, I'd be even more upset. She goes, I hate telling you why you're gone, and you're on a trip, and you're on a mission, on a mission trip, and you're the here, and you're there. I said, okay, what happened? She said, oh, this guy, they used to be members of the church years ago. And they were all buddy buddies. And they, everybody just thought, man, his guy is just the best guy. And he was in, he and his daughter, oh, they stopped in for a service and they were in town. And they said, oh man, he used to be really involved in the, in the ministry here. Hey, hey, some, somebody said, hey, remember he used to sing all the time, play his guitar and sing. Hey, can we have him do that again? And the deacon said, well, I guess we can. I guess we can do that. Not enough, a, not enough discernment to, to take the wrapper off of a lollipop. I mean, not enough, I mean, just, just not enough discernment. And so, hey, yeah, I guess that'd be all right. So the guy, so yeah, he shows up and he's got hair down on his shoulders. So she says, yeah, the guy walked in, he's got hair down on his shoulders. And I'm going, no. And I said, surely they said, no. She goes, no. No, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you, oh, man, we'd love to have Bill. Oh, Bill, man. Oh, man, we used to just love him playing the guitar and singing. Hey, Bill, would you play your guitar and sing? So he goes up there with his long hair, and I'm just thinking, and she's telling me this, and I'm just, I'm about to have an aneurysm. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, and that gets even better. And I go, oh, no. What do you do? She goes, oh, he started strumming that guitar, and he started singing. Oh, it won't be Muhammad. You know, see, he sang old Buddha. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, and what did people do? Oh, they just loved it. They just loved it. I said, thought to myself, when I get home, they ain't going to love that. <laughs> and I made no mistake about it. That's never to happen again. You say, why? Be because you don't recognize Satan. As Eve didn't recognize him when he beguiled her, and he said, Yea, hath God said. Oh, listen, he called it a question. The, the, the purpose of God. God knows that when you eat this, you'll be like, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God's. He makes it sound so good, and makes God sound so bad. And so we are tempted, and we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. And so they don't recognize the enemy. The world has never been the friend of the church. Let me say it again. The world has never been the friend of the church. We live, we live in a very treacherous time. It used to be when my dad pastored many years ago, that most of the people in that church only ever heard him preach or an evangelist or somebody that we had come in preach. And possibly when there was a revival meeting across town, something like that. That's about the extent of their exposure to preaching. You say, oh, that's terrible. No, that's a blessing. 
Why? Because it limited their exposure to falsehood, to lies, to, uh, uh, to heresy. Now, everybody sitting out there has got a window to the world. You know what's great about the internet? You can find literally anything on the internet. You know what's bad about the internet? You can find literally anything on the internet. And the problem is we don't have enough discernment to take the wrapper off of a lollipop before we lick it. We just, we don't have, we don't have, I wish I had catchy phrases like Pastor Bockhouse and a moped going around a Cheerio. Amen. I just wish I had clever things like that. But the truth of the matter is people are exposed to so many things. I can't even tell you, at least once, usually twice a year, I have to talk somebody off the ledge of Sabbath worship. Well, we're supposed to be, why aren't we pastor? Why have you never taught us we're supposed to be meeting on the Sabbath? Because we're not. Well, you know, uh, when did did you get the right to change the Sabbath? We didn't change the Sabbath. The Sabbath is still Saturday. We're not Sabbatarians. We do not worship the Sabbath. We gather together on the first day of the week to commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not trying to, listen, don't get me started. I, I have a whole speech on the Sabbath thing. But it's, listen, I mentioned last night, I think it was, that couple that, you know, really wanted to come in and, oh, we're going to bring all these people with us, remember? And we're going to bring all these, these wealthy families in if you let me teach the adult men and my wife teach the adult ladies. As I was talking to them, they said, oh, pastor, have you ever, have you ever, do you follow, oh, what's his name down, down in Texas, uh, Hagee, John, is it John Hagee? John Hagee. John, his, oh, do you follow him? I said, follow him. I, if, if he was in front of me, I'd run over him, but I don't, I don't follow him. I just, oh, we, we love him. And the wife, of course, she's, of course, it's always the woman. She's the, the sorry, ladies. Uh, uh, the wife says, oh, we just love him. Oh, I was listening to him the other day, and he was explaining how that, when the Bible says that Satan beguiled Eve, that what that means is that, that he had a physical relationship with Eve. And Eve was immoral with Satan. And the offspring was Cain. And I'm like, there's no pill for that kind of stupid. <laughs> I know this. I know, I, listen, Hagee or anybody like him wants to come up with some weird, unique slant on the Bible. All I know is this, that, that, that 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, people in my church would have never heard that because it wasn't available to them. You'd have to go down there on purpose and walk into his church on purpose and listen to that slop on purpose and decide to, listen, to agree with it on purpose. And so I said, I simply said, hey, I'll just tell you this. Not from you, not for anybody else will that heresy ever be taught at Twin Ports Baptist Church. It's a lie from the devil. You say, what's wrong with that? Oh, listen, oh, oh, oh preacher. Hey, um, hey, my 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 cousin is, uh, you know, we got this funeral for my cousin, and they, the, somebody's going to read the scriptures, and they, they, they would like to read it out of the in uh, the the New King James, and it's it's basically like the King James. It's exactly the same, except where it's different. <laughs> you say, what's the big deal? Do we believe God has preserved His Word? Amen. If you believe God has preserved it, then you decide where it's preserved. The interesting thing is, people that use that NIV do not believe God has preserved His Word. They don't even believe the NIV. You think I'm wrong, you ask them. They don't even believe it is preserved. They don't believe, they correct it. It don't matter, NASB, the HIV, uh, whatever, you know, the BVD, uh, whatever version. Hey, they don't even believe it. The only people who believe it's preserved are people that believe this book. 
Well, w- well, why don't people that believe this book just update it? Because they don't believe it needs to be updated. As someone said before me, long before me, the Bible doesn't need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread. Amen. And how often it is that we just don't even recognize the devil when he's trying to slither in and, and trying to, trying to, to, to uh, listen, uh, I, re- I remember several years ago, I was going to a funeral. It was uh, uh, one of the ladies of our church. It was her, her sister, I think, that passed away. And the funeral was at a Lutheran church. This amazed me. And so one of the guys from our church was asked, because he is a friend of the family, he, uh, he was asked, uh, the family would like you to do something. The, the Lutheran pastor said, hey, the family would like you to do something. How would you like to do the Old Testament reading? And he said, well, I'd love to do the Old Testament reading. He says, just one thing. He said, could I use my Bible to do the Old Testament reading? And the pastor said, well, I suppose that'd be all right, but can I ask you why? And the guy from my church said, well, you know, we use just the King James Bible. And so that's what I'm comfortable reading from. And if it'd be all right with you, I'll do the Old Testament, read whatever passage you want. But can I read it from my Bible? Because it's King James Bible. And he's relating this story to me. And the Lutheran pastor got really serious, uh, a somber look on his face. And he said, he said, you mean you have a King James Bible? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, yeah. He said, I've never been able to see one. <laughs> like it's an albatross. Like it's, <laughs> like, it, you know, like this, you know, this was lost centuries ago. Really? You, like you must have the only copy. He said, can I see it? The Lutheran pastor, can I see it? He said, well, sure. And he hands it to him. You know what he did? He turned it, took that Bible, that King James Bible, and he took, turned right in the book of Acts, right to the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> he opened right to that, and he goes, it is there. The verse is there. I have no idea where he came across this information about removing verses. Maybe he noticed in his Bible that it wasn't there. Maybe someone told him somewhere along the line, boy, if you could ever come across a King James Bible, <laughs> like that's not going to happen, you know? You know, look under, you know, look under a dodo bird. You know, maybe there's a King James Bible in the nest because they're, whoo, they're hard to come by, you know. <laughs> but have you ever got to look at one? And he went right to Acts chapter 8, and he looked right, and he goes, it is there. And it's like, well, there's a lot more there, too. <laughs> hey, I'm saying this. We don't recognize the the the... Uh, the enemy, because he comes in so subtly, because he co- because it's we're just gonna we're just gonna uh, let a little bit of this in and bring a little bit of the world into the church. I have so many people that you know they they don't stick. I they don't they're not really looking for Bible believing, Bible preaching. They're they're not really looking for that. But I have so many people that that come through our church preacher and they come in and they say, boy, that was nice. That was refreshing. There was a guy there for the funeral on Saturday and he told somebody in our church I haven't heard a hymn sung in years. And she said well we sing them three days a week or three times a week twice on Sunday and on Wednesday we sing them. So she said I don't know he might come back. I haven't heard a hymn sung in years years. I've had people come to my church preacher and they say, we moved to the area. We're looking for a church. We've been to 10 churches. This was the first one where anybody opened a Bible. Yes, had one guy, he was there in just our area for a short time. He was in, he was in the, um, the Coast Guard. And he said, uh, I went by and I knocked on door, his door. And they said, well, we've been kind of looking for a church. We'll come give it a try. He told me later, he said, he said, the week before you came by, I said, I am giving up looking for a church in this town. And he said, the straw that broke the camel's back, he said, I went to a church 
trying to just trying churches. And again, they weren't Baptist people, but they're just, they're just looking for a church. He said, I went to a church, I walked in, and when it came time for the sermon, the woman pastor walked up to the pulpit, never opened a Bible, and preached, talked for over 30 minutes on the subject of why I hate men. This is what passes for church. Listen, we, we might sit and wonder, oh man, it'd be nice if we could get a big crowd. It'd be nice if we could draw people in. It'd be nice if we could get folks to be attracted to the truth. And maybe we'd just put a little, you know, little uh, move the baptistry out and put a little drum set over there. And maybe we just did a few things like that. You know, instead of this grand piano, just, uh, you know, get rid of that and just, uh, just get some guitars over here. Maybe we'd attract a crowd. Hey, little by little, uh, the enemy creeps in uh, because I'm telling you what goes along with all of that is you're going to lay down the word of God and pick up a, 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 a lousy facsimile of it. It won't even be close. I almost said a reasonable, and it's not even reasonable because we don't recognize the enemy. Tobiah in the temple. Well, pastor, my, all my relatives are going to be in town this week and, and they'd love to come and, and participate in the Lord's Supper with us. And you don't know them from Tom, Dick, nor Harry. You say, oh, well, I guess well, well, they're going to be so offended if they can't do it. Listen, I've had the same situation with family members. I've had the same situation with my mother-in-law. Well, she's going to be so offended. Well, then she'll be offended. But I'm not going to offend God. Amen. Not recognizing the enemy. Number two, bringing the world right into the church. Bringing the world right into the church. We I'm always, I'm just, I'm, I'm slow to adopt things. I really am. I hate change. My wife would tell you, I am a creature of habit. I see things one way. Things are black. She, my wife says, you're a black and white guy living in a colored world. And, uh, and with me, the switch is on or off. I don't do dimmer. I, I, I just, I, I just the, these shades of this and that just do not appeal to me. I, I, I'm I don't want to be careless. I don't want to be mean, but I don't want to be careless either. Bringing things into the church to try to, you know, let's, hey, can we get some, let's, let's get some, preacher, what you need up here is some purple lights. That's what you need. Because it helps us with the mood. And instead of singing, instead of singing like, like Brother Bachhouse sings, right? <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Praise His holy name. No, let's not do that. Let's sing, oh, you know, kumbaya. <laughs> we was flipping channel somewhere in a hotel just a while back, and you come across this, okay, it's obviously a church service. And they're getting up there, and this is, oh man, this... Oh, now ready for the worship service. I'm like, okay, we're going to get to the worship service. And they, they, they start singing. And honestly, I could have memorized that whole song in about two seconds because they said the same four words about 30 times. <laughs> same four words. Pour out on us. Pour out on us. Pour out on us, 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 pour out, pour, pour out on us, pour, pour out. And it just, I'm like, how many times can they do that? And it, just, and it went on and on and on. And they finally said, Today, pour out on us, <laughs> pour out on us. 
evangelicalism. We allow evangel. A lot of churches are letting evan- basically just evangelicalism creep in. I, listen, I've had to fight it. I've lost people. I've lost members. I've lost young men training for the ministry because they. Oh man, pastor, did you see Andy Stanley's website? Man, it is sharp. That's what we need to do. Oh, what we need to do is be less churchy. A few years ago, turned out, I didn't, it wasn't a church split, it was more like a church trickle or a leak. Because it didn't happen just all at once. But my wife and I were down helping another church for a little bit that was about to go under and praise the Lord. I, I want to give God the glory that church is still going today. Amen. That's been about 10 years ago. And their, their, uh, their, their bills are current now. Their ministries are up and running. They've got a pastor and, uh, and they're serving the Lord. And I'm just, we're grateful for it. But had uh, a young man that didn't have the spiritual discernment to, if it was gunpowder, he couldn't have blown his nose. And um, and he, well, if you could start a church preacher by building a website, he'd have built 50 churches. Because that's all, he just wanted to start a website and he thought people would then come. And he's just enamored with all of this, you know, this evangelical flavor to things. And how you, and I'm just, a, again, I'm slow to change. I'm slow to, ex- why? Because I, I, I don't want to just go with the world. I, I, I just don't, I just, that's not the way I want, I just feel like I'm compromising constantly. If I follow those things, and it's just I, I, I don't see why we don't just just preach the truth. These days, you go on the average website, and I and I hope I don't. I really am not saying these things to offend, but it's something I think about. You you know, it used to be that God put some in the church, right? It used to be there were added unto the church. Right? Not today. You connect. It's not sin. It's alternate lifestyle. It's, uh, we, we can't, we can't say, say things like they are anymore because preacher, that just sounds too churchy. So I went, we were down there helping that other church and this guy had had all these conversations with and I wouldn't do this because of that and I would never support that because of that. And he goes, he decides to go across the river while I'm out of town and start another church. Of course, we know what he's really planning on doing is taking people from our church and going over there. So I get a phone call from a pastor in the state. Pastor in the state says, hey, what's going on? You're starting a church across the river? And I said, no. He goes, well, I saw this guy's thing, and so he's from your church, so I assumed you were starting a church. I said, no. He goes, well, maybe you ought to look at the Facebook page. And I'm like, okay. So I, I said, I didn't know there was a Facebook page. So I look it up, and it doesn't. It says North Point Church. What's missing from that? Baptist, North Point Church. Of course, I have an aneurysm, and I call him. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I just thought, well, you just thought wrong. And I say, that pastor's calling me. They're going to start dropping our missionaries because they think I've gone liberal and I'm starting a church without the name Baptist on it. And they're not going to support our missionaries anymore. Oh, well, no, I'm still, I'm still bad. Look at my statement of faith. It's still Baptist. I don't even get to your statement of faith. It's not a Baptist. You just accept it. You don't want anybody to know it's a Baptist church. Nobody gets to your statement of faith. If somebody's looking for a Baptist church, they don't get that far. Oh, well, I'll fix it. I said, fix it or don't fix it. You're on your own. I said, I'm throwing, I have to throw you under the bus. When these guys call me, I'm just going to tell them, hey, call you, call you and just rip, you know, you know whatever. So I get another text or another, another phone call. Another pastor said, hey, did you know about this? And well, now I'm, well, okay. Yeah, I've heard something about it now. He is not, it's not our church doing that. 
Oh, well, have you seen the website? Said, didn't know there was a website. Oh, you ought to look at the website. And pay particular attention to the introductory, you know, video thing. I'm like, so I looked at and I have my second aneurysm. And it and it, the first slide comes up, right? It's a PowerPoint thing and it's fading these in and out. The first picture comes up and it's got Solomon's temple, preacher. It's got a picture of Solomon's temple. And the caption says, Jesus started his first church in a building. Solomon's temple? Okay, Jesus preached standing on the porch <laughs> outside of the temple, but that wasn't his church building. It's completely just, it's disingenuous at best. Then it said, next slide, but then Jesus changed the way he did that and he started meeting in homes. Next slide. So we have we have studied it out, and we found a more scriptural way to do church. Well, I didn't know I was doing church. I thought I was part of a church. I thought we were trying to give God glory in the church. I thought it was a church, a body with, uh, from which He is the head. But I didn't know we were doing church. He says, we found a more scriptural way. I have my third aneurysm. I call him and I say, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm trying to reach people that don't like church. And I said, well, okay, so you've just declared that we are not doing church scripturally. He said, no, I didn't say that. I said, well, you did. You found a more scriptural way let me ask you, more scriptural than what? And I said, I happen to know that from the day of your birth until now, until I kill you, <laughs> this is the only church you've ever been a member of. So when you say you found a more scriptural way, you have to mean more scriptural than we are doing it. So you've just declared that we are not really scriptural. Oh, that's not what I mean. That's not what I mean. I said, look, you do what you want. I have to throw you under the bus. I have to tell preachers when they call me. I said, otherwise, they're going to stop supporting our ministries. They're going to stop, they're going to stop having fellowship with us. They're going to drop our missionaries because, and, and because of what you're doing. What's the danger? Letting all of this evangelicalism, well, preacher, but man, it looks sharp. I don't know. I've never looked at it. Why? I have no interest in knowing. What, what are more worldly people doing to draw more worldly people? I remember, I remember hearing a little bit, somebody was interviewing oh, one of those guys, uh, one of those hilltop guys, or, or his the, I don't know, I can't think of the guy's name right now, but one of them, the, these, Joel, uh, Joel Osteen might have been, I think it was Joel Osteen. I, th I think it was, it, it might have been Brother Graham. I don't know. But anyway, uh, Joel Osteen. And he's like, oh, we went in this area, and man, we're going to reach the unreached. And we spent a few weeks out inviting people to say, hey, say, hey we're going to start meeting over here. And, you know, it's not going to be like church or anything. And, and, uh, and he said, man, we got in there. We had, man, in our first service, we had, I think he said he had a couple of hundred people there. He's like, man, he's so excited. And then he said, I, I told you, I said, hey, man, we're, we're so glad to have you here for our first meeting. Hey, everybody grab a songbook and let's sing this song. He said, this is what he said. He said, nobody knew what a songbook was. I said, turn to such and such page. Nobody knew what that meant. They look at that song and they don't know that song. And so nobody would sing. Big surprise. What did you say? You said, come, and we're not going to be like a church. And he said, I said, hey, let's take the Bible, and nobody had a Bible. And turn to the book of such and such, and nobody heard of that book. And I said, what did you expect? This is one of my thoughts. What did you expect? You wanted to not have a church, now you don't have one. 
So what did he do? He said, well, I still like the numbers. So we just kind of let it just kind of grow and build and just kind of see what happens kind of a thing. That's evangelicalism. It's not based on the way, the truth, and the life. It's not based on what thus saith the Lord. It doesn't, you know, there's no emphatic uh, message that's preached in evangelical circles. It's just whatever you feel like doing is okay. I remember it wasn't too long after I went to Twin Ports Baptist for the Bach House. We had a few people that just, you know, they got dis- disgruntled about whatever, and they kind of left. And I was talking to one of the men, and I and I asked one of the men that was there. I said, I said, I'm not sure what the problem is. I said, the way I understood from the church before I accepted the call to come here, I understood that this church believed these things, these doctrines, these points of separation. I was led to believe that that's what y'all believed. And I said, and that's all I've been preaching. And he said, boy, I don't know, preacher, I'm going to think about that. And he came back a little bit later and he said, you know, I think I I figured it out. And I said, well, please tell me. I'm curious. What's going on? He said, well, yeah, all those things are the same. But he said, he said, the way it's always been presented before was it was just more kind of like an option. He said, the way you preach it is kind of like, more like mandatory. The the way you preach it is kind of like, you know, there's no wiggle room. And I said, well, if that's what it is, then I'm glad. Because guess what? There is no wiggle room. This is God's house. This is God's word. They got Tobiah in this chamber in the temple. He's an enemy of the people of God, but he has married into it. Then, what did it, let me ask you this. What did bringing Tobiah into the temple do for Tobiah? It gave him legitimacy. When you allow it, when you allow it to come in, it, it puts a stamp on it. It makes it acceptable. Man, I had, to, I had to undo old Buddha. I had to get up and say, look, folks, I'm sorry. That's not what passes for singing songs that bring honor and glory to God around here. That's, not, that's nowhere close to, oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. Consider all the worlds I hands have made. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. It's a long cry from old Buddha. Happened to me one time, we had a family that came through, and they came through several times, and they were, they were a blessing. They were very, very talented. I mean, uh, one of the teenage girls had won the Florida State Fiddle Championship five or six times as a teenage girl. Outside of her, no one under 65, I think, had won it in like 30 years. She won it like four or five times running. They, uh, one of the, matter of fact, the Presley family hired her to play with them eventually, long after we knew them, play down in Branson with the, with the, the, the family down there. She's very, very, they were very talented. Well, we knew them, the children were a little bit younger, and they were, they would go in and do concerts for, gospel concerts and give the gospel, etc. And so uh, when they came by, we'd, we'd have them uh, sing a song here or there and do things like that, maybe play for the offering. And, and it, was always, it was always just some you know, arrangement of hymns or whatever. And, and some of them, one of them played the, like the string bass and one played the piano, one played the, the, the violin and, and there was a couple of instruments and, and etc. And so um, we were getting ready for a service and and my wife uh, came down and said, oh, that, that family's here. Would you like them to do the offering? And I said, offer to her. I said, oh, that'd be fine. Just go ahead and do that. And so, so this uh, Pastor Reno was sitting on the platform. He was my assistant pastor at the time. And it came time for the offering. And, and so I, I, I got up there and I said, okay, we're going to take the offering. This family's going to play the offertory. And it's always been a blessing. And I'm sure it'll be a blessing today. And so I prayed and and, uh, and I went and sat down in my spot and they began. And the, the, the one young lady, she came to the pulpit and she said, today I want to play for you that great old favorite, the Orange Blossom Special. And I'm like, 
Say what? Now, if you're from the South, you, you know it's got more than one name, but that's but it's the Orange Blossom Special. And the one on the piano starts playing, ding, 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 ding. And she starts playing, wee, 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 and she plays it, and she plays it masterfully. And I'm sitting over there going, what in the world are we doing? And I thought, well, it's, at least it's almost over. And she got done, and the person on the one on the piano kept going, ding, 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 ding. And she said, hey, uh, uh, if you would like me to hear it, play it faster, on the count of three, Everybody say a big yee-haw. We were not a big yee-haw church. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. But not much on the yee-haw. So she said on the count of three, everybody let out a big yee-haw. She goes, one, two, three. And the people go, yee-haw. And she put the bow to the fiddle, and she went, man, and she was just playing. And I thought, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And I thought, good, she's all, she's playing fast. She get done fast. She got done. The one on the piano kept going, and she said, "If you'd like to hear me play at my absolute fastest, on the count of three, everybody say a big yeehaw." Now, what has happened is, everybody in the church has seen me over there, and I am just, I mean, I'm red, I'm sweating bullets. I said to Pastor Reno, had a smile on my face, but I said to Pastor Reno, I said, the staff member that knew about this is fired. <laughs> but I didn't let anybody else see that thing. And they're just looking at me, and they knew I was way out of my comfort zone. So that second time when she said, if everyone wants to hear this my absolute fastest, say it on the count of three, a big yee-haw. She goes, one, two, three. And now they're all into it because they see what I, I'm sweating bullets over there. They go, yeah, man, they were into it. And she played and smoke was coming off the string. I mean, wow. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? So she got done and they finally quit. And I was so thankful that it stopped. <laughs> and I walked to the pulpit and I did the only thing I knew to do. Make a joke. I said, thank God for that great old hymn of the faith, the Orange Blossom Special. <laughs> I was saved after listening to the Orange Blossom Special. It's been meaningful to me all, ever, all my life, you know. And people are just cracking up and rolling on the floor because I'm making a big heel. But I had to just do it. But I said, you know what? After that, that, that family was long gone, the next service I said, folks, hey, ain't never going to happen again. Somebody's going to come do a special. We're going to know what you're going to do. Why? Because I don't want people thinking that that's what's going to happen. I think we ought to guard God's house. They did not recognize the enemy. They brought the world right into the church. But then notice what is the consequence of that. By the way, what did it do for Tobiah? Gave him legitimacy. Let me ask you this. What did it do for the church? What did it do for the house, excuse me, what did it do for the house of God? It robbed it of its testimony, power, and its priesthood. You say of its priesthood? Yeah. You remember what used to be in that chamber? The things that they would take care of the priests with. The things that they would take care of the singers with. You know what suffered? Real ministry. Real service. In the service of the house of God, right? That's your thing. That's what suffered was the service of the house of God. Why? Because we don't, we're not doing that anymore. All we're doing is about the next production or the next, or the next program or the next uh, 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 musical or whatever it can be. And so the house of God, listen, you can do that and it legitimizes the world and it legitimizes entertainment. But for God's house, God's house is, it, it suffers, it's robbed of its testimony, its power, and its purpose, and, and, its, and, and the ministry that it has. They stopped caring for the ministers because they had given away the chamber to the enemy of the house of God. That's what happens when relationship trumps truth. Say, so, well, yeah, but it's my cousin, it's my brother. Okay, great. I hope they get saved. I hope they come to know the Lord. 
but this is God's house. Well, preacher, listen, uh, um, we'd like, to, you know, my family's coming to town and we don't have much room at our house. And, and we're going to have, you know, my family, you know, they're not saved. They, they like to do wine tasting. Can we, can we use the fellowship hall on a, on a non-church night? And just, just have a little, I mean, it won't be, it won't be, much, just a little tasting. How about no? How about not today? Tomorrow's not looking good either. How about like never? How about it's not going to happen? You see, listen, I, I, I've used this illustration once or twice before. Maybe somebody here has heard it. I don't know. I was in a mission, on a mission trip in Brazil. My wife calls me. I call my wife. I say, hey, how are things going? And she said, oh. And she said, well, there, there's, there is trouble. And I said, okay. I'm sitting down. What is it? What's the trouble? She says, well, you know, you know the lady that's been coming to the church for about a year? Name the name? I said, yes. And she says, turns out she's not a lady. I have no idea how I've survived all the aneurysms I've had. I think that was the mother of aneurysms. I said, so what you're telling me is I've had a man in my lady's restroom for a year. She said, yeah. You say, didn't you know? I just thought it was an ugly woman. I honestly have no idea why an average looking man would choose to be an ugly woman instead. <laughs> At least an average looking man, you got a shot. But as an ugly woman, you got no shot. And, that, and the, those average looking men that want to do that, they all turn into ugly. They, they think they're women, but it's just... I said, you call, get off the phone, you call the deacon. Well, this is when you did not want to be my deacon. I said, you call the deacon. You tell the deacon to call that individual. I refuse to call it a woman. I said, you call, have, call that individual. And you say, the pastor said, under no circumstances are you welcome back on our property for any reason. And if that person says, well, Why? Just say, the pastor will be back in two weeks. If you have any questions, you can call and ask him. Of course, that person knew why. Because someone had just asked, finally, you know, I found out how it came out. One of our ladies was talking to this individual and said, I just have a question for you. Did you start off life as a man or a woman? <laughs> well, as a man. So she called my wife, my wife called me. I told my wife, tell the deacon, the deacon called it. And I came home to messages stacked up, answering machine, voicemails. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to bury you. I'm going to own the church. I'm going to do I'm gonna, all these lawsuits and et cetera, et cetera. I said, I don't care. I'd rather have none of this. This is God's house. You say, well, we should be accepting. To, no, no, this is God's house. You say, well, don't you hope that people are like, yeah, I hope they get saved, yeah. But if they get saved, they're not going to keep doing that. Can't let relationship trump what is true. God made Adam and Eve. Animals do not suffer from gender dysphoria. They know. They've got it figured out. Man, because, because the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You want to know the answer to, as the lady asked me at the graveside last Saturday, 
Why are there so many wicked people in the world? There was a news story on your news since I've been here. And they've got a big problem in the public schools with, what are they called, furries? Is that, is that what it is? You know, kids identifying as cats and dogs. And coming to school in full face masks and claws. And now they're attacking and scratching one another because that's what animals do. And the teacher's like, no, you can't, no, you can't stop me from this. This is the way I identify. And that's on your news here, so I assume it's somewhere here locally. We live in a wicked, messed up, sick world. You say, what are you going to do? All I can say is, not in God's house. Not in God's house. No Tobiah in the temple. Listen, I know this is you know, in the service of the house of God, right? But that means that it has to be his house. I mean, it has to be, it has to be for him. If we're not careful, our associations with the world creep into our service for Christ. We have all these clever things that we can do to, to and, and I'm not opposed, listen, I'm not opposed to using something like Facebook to try to get the gospel out if you can do that with it. It's a tool. I don't like those kinds of things. I don't like uh, social media the way it, it is used. I just refuse to do it. But if you can do it and use it as a ministry and an outreach and actually see people say, I, I'm not opposed to that. I'm not opposed. I, I still believe you ought to go you know, door to door. I, you ought to go out where people are. I still believe you ought to do that too. I believe you can get on television. Uh, we, we get on the, the local cable channel in, in, in our city and it's something that's provided uh, for churches in our community. If you can do that, I, I'm for that. If you can live stream it, I, I'm not for people sitting home from church to watch the live stream, but, but if there are people who can't get to church, then, then, you know, then I, you know, I'm for that. I, I'm, for, I'm for doing what doesn't uh, uh, cause uh, the, the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ any damage to reach the world for Christ. I'm for that. But we just need to be so careful that we don't invite Tobiah into the temple. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.